chill to make it go then chill. I got the credentials that it's the we said chill to make a rap and chill. Then you know I will fulfill. Make a couple of mil as I build the guild for all the rappers to skill and kill the weak rappers with no frill. Hang him in effigy if he's a sucker. Hang him to the left of me because my right hand man is my mic stand and the microphone that I own and my game plan is keep it at a steady pace. Ain't no reason to rush. It ain't no race. I'ma hit the top just when I wanna. And it's a matter of time and I'm gonna because I know when to go ahead and enter the classic Modi rap that sent you running around holding your head asking your homeboy yo man you heard what he said another funky rhythm look at your man and give him a high five because I'm live running around with him telling everybody hanging out on the block it's time to wake up and check the clock punch it I go to work I go to work Go to work, go to work, go to work. You just gotta love it. Indeed. Yes, this is the Go to Work radio show. And we're going to be listening to Davy D, a journalist, a historian on the Hip Hop for Justice Cause. That starts at 6 p.m. Please tell a friend, share. You can check out the flyer and tune in on your own, on your phone. And just remember to mute yourself. It is going to be very, very informative. So let's check this song out by United for the young man in South Central LA.
We absolutely go to work, go to work, getting ready for the Hip Hop for Justice conference call, national conference call. That part right there, get excited, get all pumped up. You understand me? Because it's great education coming your way. That part, just like we want to say, we got to go to work. We got to go to work. Like Kumo D say, go to work. That part right there. Touchdown, move on this policy, ain't bringing it modestly. 
like Odyssey. I was telling a story through real artistry, ignoring every piece of my heart. Look what you started, see, had to switch it up. Was the only way logically. Don't consider me a casualty after the fact. Cats need to know what the stats be. Clutching on they gas, better know who your past be. Hunting the men they sleep, ain't no running from this travesty. Head swelling since 9-4. Ain't no telling rap chests behind closed doors. Professor Lesson, I'm guessing the test be so gore. I'm bringing eye of the tiger, listen to me. Three times my weight, last dragon feeling the glow. You gorgeous ladies, wrestling, transcending your flow. So why you still acting? Somebody hand me my powder. You need a pimp smack. You made a meal of these cats. I'm just snacking. Do you know who you woke up? Gonna be trouble. The presentation be conduct. The reservation of one mind beyond up. If in it rhymes, your whole squad been chopped up. School face can't even speak me. Banana hammock wearing the sleep. One the full bag is all you keep. That deliverance leaving them weak. It's so cold, leave a Siberian hut stuck. Honest to God, I'll be the one I'm the truth. Honest to God, when I step into the booth. Honest to God, I'm the one. To the constellations, grabbing your fate like the beat keep breaking, leaving them belly hurting, feeling anticipation. They know that when it drop, it burns. Simple harass, question your status. Yes, I'm the maddest. Fear of my black hat, sis. Get back first track. Go to war, brought that exposing your simple spat flows with all my old tracks. Hunting you down just like a dentist. Murdering people just fun, no real nourish. Your simulated comfort about to be deplenished. Releasing lyrical cracking, whipping your fixings. Turned up on a Tuesday. When your chick in the club, she ain't Tuesday. Do buying the drinks, oh, now she loose, hey. Hit him with that EBT, now you're Monday. Honest to God, I'll be the one, I'm the truth. Honest to God, when I step into the food. Honest to God, I'm the one, I'm the man. Honest to God. Yeah, like- 
justice. I'm very honored and proud to say that as a collective, we've held this. We are now, like I said, we're now in our third year. Um, but the Mario Woods murder was something that was so horrific to us here in the San Francisco Bay Area because you literally saw a firing squad of police officers execute publicly 26-year-old black male Mario Woods, December the 2nd, 2015, just two months before the golden anniversary of the NFL Super Bowl, Super Bowl 50. Super Bowl 50 was held in the, at the Santa Clara Levi Stadium where the 49ers play. And that was uh, the Super Bowl that Cam Newton and the Carolina Panthers were in. But it was hosted by the city of San Francisco. The only reason they didn't play in San Francisco is because the 49ers don't play in San Francisco anymore. But that murder of Mario Wood and the Super Bowl coming two months later, the Super Bowl's pre- the, 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 the attracting power of that Super Bowl was so great because, again, it was the 50th anniversary. It's the golden anniversary. And the grandparents celebrate 50 years of marriage. That's a big thing. And you don't just send a card on that anniversary. You don't just call grandma on that anniversary. That's when the family gets together it makes that thing a big deal because it is a big deal. That's 50 years of, of soldiering together. That's 50 years of, of working to become one, ups and downs, trials and tribulations, struggles, difficulties, good times, bad times, smiles and frowns and tears and excitement and joy and love and sometimes even, you know, language of dislike or disdain or hate. You know what I mean? Depending on the circumstances that they've gone through in those 50 years. But when you reach a milestone like that, it's something that's celebrated in a very big way. San Francisco being the whole city of Super Bowl 50 was a very, very big deal. There was a lot of, quote-unquote, very big, powerful people coming into the city. There was hundreds of millions of dollars, I would imagine, coming into this city. So how could you come under severe scrutiny for a public execution by your sworn police officers of this young man, and it was caught on camera, on cell phone camera? You didn't want that. You didn't want to jeopardize that. And so the cover-up, my language that I've used, the cover-up began after the last shot was fired. The then chief of police was saying that Mario lunged at the police officer. Mario never lunged at the police officers. The video will show you he never even made a threatening gesture to the police officers unless you call turning to walk away a threatening gesture. That means all of us will be lunging at somebody at some point today, tonight, tomorrow, if turning to walk away is a threatening gesture. But that's what the then chief of police, Greg Sir, put out in the public. And he didn't come under no fire by any other city officials or, or any of that. And so the, the, the frustration and the outrage of the community uh, began to rise that evening and the next day and the weeks to come and we organized ourselves into what was called the Justice for Mario Woods Coalition. Long story short, personally, I started to look at certain artists' social media pages and I did not see any type of outcry. Nothing equal to that of the outcry I saw from Sports and Entertainment when it came to Mike Brown, Tanja Bland, Freddie Gray, Walter Scott, Trayvon Martin, Oscar Grant. Nothing. I didn't see anything like that when it came to Mario Woods. That frustration led me to call my brother, my partner, Brother James, uh, known as James Bond from Public Enemy, a founding member of the legendary Public Enemy, who is on the line. Um, and he and I had a conversation. He saw the footage of Mario Woods being murdered, and the idea came from that conversation that we had that we need to call a conference call. We need to get Chuck. We need to get other artists, parents, other artists, Ham, who we were listening to before we officially started. Um, you know, artists, whoever we could reach and get, we needed to get them on the phone, and then we would ask. Uh, student minister Christopher Muhammad, who is the leading, was the 
leading voice on the ground for Justice for Mario Woods Coalition, um, one of the primary organizers, um, and the student minister here in San Francisco for the Nation of Islam, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. We shot the idea by him, he loved it, asked us to go with it, and set a date, and we did that. And now here we are entering into our, in, the, in our third year with this platform and we have done nothing but grow artists by the dozens are constantly responding to our call um, and it's very it's a, it's a very organic it's a very beautiful thing our guest this evening and I know I got my sister to half time some of the verses is on the ground sitting on the ground table with us like I said James on for public enemy he's on with us um, but our guest this evening is somebody that we called on in the very beginning. He responded as he was on the ground with the fight for justice for Oscar Grant. Um, he's a brother that I've known for many, many years. He's also a, a, a friend of Public Enemy, the entire group, very close with Chuck and members of Public Enemy, known for many years. He's well respected within the hip hop community um, because not only does he come from the, the MC side and in his background, but he's somebody who loves the culture, loves the music, works to, to help to preserve the culture, but he's also a man who loves his people, he's a lover of justice, he's a, love, a lover of what is right, and wherever there's a fight for justice and a fight for what is right, no matter who has been deprived of justice or who has been done wrong, if he knows about it and he's able, he's there. If he's not able to be there, he's chronicling it. He's talking about it on his platform. He's a, 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 a host of his own show, multiple shows. Um, he's a hip-hop journalist, a historian, a protector of the culture. So it's an honor to have our brother on. He's no stranger to this call, but tonight we're featuring him as our special guest at the round table because as you know um, those that are listening we have become like the TED Talks of hip hop so we basically have asked the guest speakers to come on and, and address a particular topic the topic is the state of hip hop the state of the black community the state of the world and the need for a cultural revolution we, we do that like that because hip hop is not something that's no more local it's, it's not relegated to the Bronx not relegated to New York. It's a global reality. It's a global culture embraced by the youth, particularly all over the world, but everybody has been affected by hip-hop. R&B is hip-hop today. Jazz is hip-hop today. Gospel is hip-hop today. Everything is hip-hop. TV is hip-hop. Movies are hip-hop. So, of course, fashion is hip-hop. So, when you talk to the state of, of of hip hop, that's something that I think is not a, a light question. Um, and I, I definitely want us all to benefit from the knowledge of our brother and our guest, David E. this evening, on that question. You say the state of the black community. Why? Well, Chuck B. said, said once in, you, you, you say you love hip hop, do you love the people that it comes from? You can't say you love the apple but hate the apple tree. So we got to understand that that when we see hip-hop, it's a reflection of the community. It's a reflection of the state of mind of our people. When we listen to the music, we're, we're not just listening to people saying anything empty and they sound like it. But we're really dealing with something that's a lot deeper than, than what we want to box in as mumble rap or dumbed-down music. You're dealing with the state of mind. And I think that the subject matter is something that's that's something that we need to, to explore, the state of the world, again, hip-hop is global, and then the need for a cultural revolution. That's the topic of, of our discussion this evening. We want to hear from our brother Gabe and Dee on that topic, and then we want to begin a dialogue amongst the roundtable. We may be joined by a few others this evening, but we don't want to take up any more time. We want to welcome our brother James Brown, my sister half Pint. We're going to welcome and bring... To the forefront, our brother and our guest, Davey D. My brother, Davey D., you're on. Hey, how you doing? Can you hear me clear? Yes, sir. You're coming in loud and clear. Okay. Uh, I mean, this, the question that you asked, the state of hip-hop, I think, is a, is a big one. Um, and I kind of break it down like this. Um, hip-hop 
is a microcosm of what's going on in the world, um, period. Um, there's an upside, there's a downside, there's a challenging side, there's a triumphant side to it. Um, that's one thing. The second thing I like to remind people is that hip-hop has many tentacles, and a lot of times we talk about hip-hop is primarily talking about rap in these discussions. And our conversation often focuses around uh, the, the rap music that is played in commercial outlets. So we'll listen to a group like Migos or Cardi B or, um, or whoever they happen to be playing on commercial radio. And we start to have conversations based upon that presentation, uh, whether it's good, bad, or whatever. And, and that's a worthwhile conversation because what is presented in corporate, corporate entities has an impact on society. So, to the degree that we feel that corporations are poisoning our minds, uh, to the degree that we feel corporations are undermining our culture, or what have you, it should be challenged. Uh, and so that's one discussion that I think is ongoing and we continuously have. The second part is understanding that hip-hop as a culture is, in my opinion, is doing quite well all around the world. Um, if you go to some of the b-boy or breakdancing, you know, that, that people usually call it that, uh, competitions, you're seeing 10, 20,000 showing up. You're seeing that there's cultural exchanges between countries many of us never gone to. We see that there's communication going on, there's bonds being built. Um, and, and that in itself is a whole world that we can and should uh, when you talk about the turntable or turntablism, similar type of scenario. All around the world, people are exchanging, people are building, and it's very vibrant, very vibrant scene internationally. Uh, if you talk about the grass or the uh, aerosols, similar thing. You know, I have some friends here that are pioneering artists in the Bay that have gone back and forth to, um, you know, to the continent. You know, you also know the names like Three for One and, and, and the aerosol crew that he has. I mean, they're doing big things. And, and really, you know, taking that aesthetic and those expressions and the politics connected to it to the next level. But when I said there's a microcosm, uh, when we look about, when we talk about hip-hop in the United States, it's a microcosm of how we are in, 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 in the larger society. You see several things. First of all, hip-hop is global, but the average person in the United States wouldn't tell you the global the, the globalness of the culture. They'd be hard to right. You know, right. I'm saying this to somebody who teaches large hip-hop classes that have been state for the past 10 years. I have two or 300 students, and I, and I check them. I ask them. All right, hip-hop is global. $20 if you can name more than five MCs from Mexico. And we're in California. You can't, most people can't do it. Name wow. more than four or five MCs from Canada, other than Drake, and people are stuck. But if you go to London, or you go to France, or you go right. to Kenya, uh, I mean Nairobi in Kenya, and you start asking folks, they have a global understanding. They, they know what's going on in Brazil. They know the artists there. They know the artists in Australia, and vice versa. So the U.S. has always been this kind of uh, uh, isolated entity where folks only speak one language and have very little knowledge in comparison with the rest of the world about global happenings. Uh, even those of us who are oppressed oftentimes have mimicked and taken on the habits of the dominant culture, where it's just like USA. We don't say USA in chances like that, but our attitude when we walk into a place is like, well, I'm from New York or I'm from the state, is almost as arrogant as the white folks that would chant USA. We're not really sincere and intentional, collectively speaking. You know, we can only find individuals that buck that, but collectively speaking, we're not really trying to check for, for, for things on a global tip. Now, part of that is that people are in survival mode. So people are just trying to survive, and hip hop has become a tool of survival, so how do I get my hustle on? If you want to hear some pimp rap, I'll give you a pimp song. And that will be paid. If you want to hear something about women shaking their booty, I'll put it in the video. So it's about survival versus really nurturing a culture 
and taking it to a higher level. It's like, I need to get paid, and I can sell drugs, do sports, or do this hip-hop thing. And so we got to kind of recognize that aspect of it. Um, the other thing that we have to look at is that we've always been under assault for our cultural expression. I think those who have who, who are oppressive are very aware that we communicate on multiple multiple ways. They know that we, you know, once upon a time communicated through the drum. They know that we communicate through emotion. We know that if we uh, if we sing and we, we uh, vocalize, that can move people in ways that you know that you just can't always uh, put a label on. And so there's always been a fear of that. And at every turn, there's been an attempt to either study and undermine or redirect for use the culture against us. Um, what I often like to tell people is to go on YouTube and type in the name Dark Heart Perry. Uh, Dark Heart Perry uh, or Mike Briggs or his, his name, his, his code name was Othello, was an FBI informant. Um, and his job was to infiltrate all these cultural organizations during the 1960s and right. undermine them. And right. the one that he does, that he's talking about, he's doing an interview on ABC News, um, if you watch the video with right. Ray Gil Noble, he's speaking right. and he's saying, look, you know, uh, we at the FBI study black culture. We right. study it, we, we pay attention to every detail, we collect everything, we know all the records, know all the artists. Right, and right. Gil Noble asked him, said, well, why did you do it? He says, in order to infiltrate the people, you have to infiltrate, you have to understand the culture. In order right. to control the people, you have to control the culture. And so this is what he said in 19, I guess, 77 or 78 when it aired. He also right. talked about in that interview how he burned down the Watch Writers Workshop. The Watch Writers right. Writer Workshop uh, was home to uh, Quincy Jones, uh, right. uh, Yakamoto, uh, right. Watch Prophet. Uh, all That's of them right. came out of the Watch Writers Workshop. And when he was asked, why did you burn it down? He said the Bureau wanted this to burn down because they were going to get a grant and they were going to continue to do work that they found to be threatening. So right. let's just pause for a moment and understand that this is what he was doing in the 1960s. And fast forward to what we have now. Uh, okay. I usually bring into my class an array of books that were written by the police. Very detailed, paid close attention to everything, uh, had all the analysis, you know, uh, just incredible work. And the one, the books that I have was written by a brother who, you know, who I've had conversations with who said he wanted people to understand the difference between, you know, what was going on in the streets and what was going on in the culture, which I can get. I can understand, but if he got those type of information, what are those people who are above him who I don't have conversations with, what do they have? And so, you know, the book that I had, it was like the influence of the nation of gods and earth on hip hop, right. the influence right. of the Black Panthers on hip hop, the influence of of uh, nation of Islam on, on the Panthers. I mean, on, on hip hop. Uh, let's look at all the lyrics, you know, and let's let's trace the line between how Chuck D raps and how Paul Robinson might have vocalized. So you have this great detail, and I only and I use this as an example to to to, to hold on a second.
what they're about and study everything that they do, uh, whether it's you trying to get an independent platform, I mean, you name it, you see that there's going to be a challenge. And so uh, a challenge to it, and one to hopefully derail whatever direction that you're headed in. And so um, I, I think, you know, those three aspects mean that uh, the fight is not a one-size-fits-all thing. I think you pick an area, and then you really go into it. If you're going to preserve the culture of hip-hop, then that's your fight. Figure out how to create institutions that we control, uh, institutions that, that are accessible to us, institutions that will uh, allow us to have some sort of economic independence, and you grow that. Somebody else has to go, okay, my job and my commitment will be to challenge uh, will be to challenge uh, those who are attacking us and trying to undermine the culture. So you look at all those we, all those entities and you figure out, okay, how can we take them down? How can we neutralize them? How can we uh, redirect them? How can we expose them? All those types of things. So you look at the Fox Newses of the world. You look at the CBSs and the ABCs, and you see how they are, are, are uh, uh, you know, bastardizing our culture. So that's, that's, that's the other thing. And then lastly, I said, you know, this, this thing called hip-hop is expression. And it's expression that comes out of oppression. And so I think we have to have, a, a, I think, a richer understanding of what that really means. Uh, in other words, to me, I hear people say, well, they got all this mumble rap and, you know, and can't stand it. And, you know, they're not saying anything. And I take a different opinion on that, you know. I, yeah. I, mean, I mean, there's a reason why they do what they do. Some, you know, first of all, they're, they're, it's not in the vacuum, so they're influenced by what goes on in society, for better or for worse. So that, that's a challenge. Uh, right. Many people do see it as a tool of survival. I'm not putting $100 in their pocket. I'm not paying their rent. I'm not taking care of their economic hardship, and they figured out a way to do it. So they're going to go in a direction that they think will be successful. And in their own ways, at least my experience, is people are trying to take care of you know, their people and their families. So we can sit there and have a conversation with them. And when I say conversation, it's about back and forth to see where they're coming from and hopefully they see where you're coming from and, co and together we grow. You know, I'll understand what they're saying. They'll understand where I'm coming from as somebody who's older and maybe they might be able to do uh, a, a few uh, things that will, you know, be a bit different than what, what, what we have, you know, perceived them to only be doing. So nurturing and having a commitment to uh, dealing with those who are coming into the culture uh, is something is another battlefront that there needs to be a body of people that that is what they do. I don't think you can do all three at once. And, 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 I, and I think when you do that, everything gets diluted and you, and you lose on all fronts. So uh, I'll close with this. Those are the challenges. Uh, I think I started off by saying I see hip-hop vibrant in so many ways. I see mm -hmm. folks... Uh, making moves that once upon a time you couldn't make. I see people doing their own films, their own documentaries. I see people uh, globally connecting with one another. I see people, um, you know, very sophisticated with their lyrics and their content and their analysis. Uh, and, yeah, it's not going to be on any corporate media outlet. It's not going to be on a Hot 97. It's not going to be on a KML. It's not going to be on... It's not going to be on any of the uh, outlets. So it's going to be up to us to, first of all, make a commitment to support them and find ways to bring that to the forefront. And it's going to be up to us to um, not define the debate and the discussion around what corporations who have already stated that their main goal is to undermine and use culture against us. We shouldn't be, you know, um, using their words and their analysis on things. We should have our own and really go full throttle with that. Hope that makes sense. Man, absolutely. Absolutely. You said quite a bit, and, and I want to open up and kick the round table off with my sister Half Pine, who you you all share um, uh, the position of educator, multiple positions. I mean, you hip-hop, she's hip-hop, but as, a, as somebody who's in uh, teaching, you're on the on the college level. Half time is at the high school level, and um, a part of of what she does for us is she spearheads 
the Universal Hip Hop Academy, which is something that we've been working on under the name Hip Hop University, um, which is the name that we came up with in a dialogue with Minister Chris. He actually the one who threw it out there because there's so many legendary artists on this one particular call, and the dialogue that he was listening to um, was something, I don't know if it was Crying Tail that was on the call that night as well, but at any rate, what he had heard inspired him to share this idea that was, you know, there needs to be a, a university, you know, something online where, I mean, naturally you could bring people, and we got Johnny Juice out here, um, but DJ Johnny Juice, who we posted on the call for another legendary DJ, producer, engineer, um, but to to have something where, you know, that history, that oral history, the living history of the culture can be accessed, where webinars can be uploaded and people can access DVDs, webinars, Grandmaster Cavs, Cool Herc, Sam Bada, Chuck B, Wise Intelligent, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, Lady of Rage and Yo-Yo and MC Light and, you know, who, whoever it is, you know, whether they were MCs, DJs, producers, you know, whatever lane they, they travel in, um, but it's something that we, the idea that we've taken and I'm, you know, I, I we spoke with clientele, and I know the Universal Hip Hop Museum. There's there's something that they have going on. Clientele mentioned this existing curriculum, um, and there may be others. And I know Kaz was doing, you know, tours like mobile tours, and, that, and I'm sure there's a lot happening. But our humble little effort, half pint spearhead this for us on our behalf because he's been an educator at Roosevelt, Long Island for over 20 years. So I want to I want to have Half Pint chime in right now because I think Davey is a, is a resource of immeasurable value. Um, he's somebody, as, you, as we all just heard, you know, he has the arsenal. He has the information. He has the knowledge. And I think that somebody like Davey would be a great resource to help us with what we're doing Um in, in every aspect of, of what we're doing. So half pint, hearing what our brother said, let's kick this round table discussion on. I want to bring our big brother chairman, Fred Hampton Jr., who's on the line. Chairman, I know you're on. I want you to call me direct because I want to bring the chairman in to this uh, round table. So chairman, you're hearing me. If you can just go ahead and hang that line up and call me direct and let's bring you into this round table discussion. But Half pint. Let's let's kick it off with you, and then go shoot on over to my brother James Bob, and let's get this dialogue started. That we want to end it with the need for a cultural revolution. Davey touched on the state of hip hop, the black community, and the world. But we want to deal with as we end the call. When we end the call, the need for a cultural revolution. But based off what we've heard thus far, half pint. Feel free. Let's hear you chime in, and let's get this roundtable dialogue going. Absolutely. Thank you, Brother Miles and um, Brother James. Um, which, uh, I'm just like, kind of speechless a little bit. <laughs> Listening to, you know, Brother James. Man, he came with a lot, didn't he? Yes, he did. Yes, he did. And, but that's what the historian does. And to be able to manifest that into a lesson as a professor on a level of higher learning, that is definitely what we need because, again, like you said, it's a culture. And too many people are wrapped up in the idea of rap defining the culture or, we, you know, of, of what we hear. And that's only one aspect, one little, like you said, the pinnacle or the element. There's so much more than just that. But that is at the forefront of what defines hip hop, unfortunately, today um, around the world. And being able to have, you know, educators or conversations and roundtables and all these other things that we're putting together, not just us, but other places putting together a format where we are dictating the narrative and telling our story from the people that actually lived it, that's what's going to be important. Um, and I think that, you know, hopefully at some point we will be able to connect with all of those things and have one foundation where we have different, just like we have different elements and different cynical groups do the same thing. But, um, Brother David D., I wanted to um, extend, you know, the opportunity for you to please be a part of 
what we're doing and putting together because, again, you are a plethora of information and data, mm-hmm. and I think that you have a lot to offer and bring to our program. Um, let, me, let, me just, let me just say, first of all, I appreciate the invite. Let me just say something about this, uh, you know, uh, documenting and all that. There's a number of people that have been doing this for a minute, um, and I don't think there's uh, I mean, it's always good to get as much as you can, um, but there's, right. also, there's also people that have been doing it. Um, one person that I think is tremendous, well, there's, there's a few. Uh, Jay Kwan, you should know his name, Jay Kwan. Look him up. He has a site called The Foundation. Um, him and a brother named Troy um, have been incredible. They've caught a lot of the people, um, you know, many who have passed, you know, Starsky and others, um, you know, rest, they rest in peace. They caught those interviews, and what I like about them is that Jay Kwan uh, comes from Virginia, and so he had an outside-looking-in perspective. He was somebody outside of New York, so he, he brings to the table a different type of uh, inquiry um, that somebody who, who's in the culture would not necessarily uh, ask. Troy um, is a street cat. And so when you look at his interviews, what I think is wonderful is that he's not just talking about the, the culture in terms of their performance, but he's also talking about, uh, you know, all the stuff that's going on. So you'd be like, oh, I didn't know uh, so-and-so was out in the street doing that. I didn't know so-and-so lived this type of life. So you're capturing right. a real important aspect of what leads to the expression in the first place. I think a lot of times you want to sanitize it and act like, you know, it, it was something in a vacuum when really it came from grit and grind and, 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 and folks who were on the other side of the track. And, and, and seeing how they captured those journeys, I think, are important. So those are two people that you should be checking out and having a conversation with. Um, the other one is a gentleman by the name of Mark Skills. Um, he's originally from Queens and lives in Atlanta. Mark is very similar. He does a lot of writing. He's caught a lot of... Uh, those primary interviews with folks who are gone, you know, like uh, Pete DJ Jones and others, and he has a way in which he pulls out a lot of stuff. And then, you know, there's an array of people, um, you know, there's a number of writers out here, there's a number of writers out here, you know, like Eric Arnold, um, who's doing a, a project for right. the now. Um, mm-hmm. You know, myself, I got a lot of archives. Um, if you're able to catch the folks that uh, black who did Murder Dogs, you know, all these things are important, and, you know, just to have, the same way the FBI has collected it. So when you go and say, oh, DJ's fucking passed, um, I want to see what he has to say. You should be able to have six or seven different interviews from different people so you can read it. You have some footage you're able to tell, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I know in L.A., they've been doing an oral project. I think that's important to, to tap into uh, what some of the folks have been doing. And, you know, and then lastly, I'll say this. Hip-hop is, we, what, we, what, what came out of New York is what we call hip-hop. And we look at that. But the question for me has always been, what else is going on at the same time as hip-hop was emerging in New York? And so when you start to go that, across yeah. the map, when you start to go across the, the, the map, you go, well, in New York... We had four or five member crews, so in 1978, 77, I was in a crew, right? The Avengers, Double D crew out of Co-op City, and, you know, and this is what we did, you know? Uh, I mean, TDK crew out of Co-op City, so this is, you know, we, we had a, two DJs and three MCs and all that. So at 13 or 14, what was our equivalent doing in, say, Washington, D.C., right down the road? And you go down there and go, oh, of a timeline. They were, they were doing go-go at the same time. They had no knowledge of what we were doing in New York, nor did they care, and vice versa. So there's a whole set of expressions that come out of this same group of people, of black folks who are young, who are finding themselves fighting oppression. So they actually have an oral history around that go-go scene, which I would umbrella as part of our collective you know, a way in which we responded. You go to Chicago. Right now I'm with a bunch of people from Chicago who've been doing this for a long time, so that's why you hear the noise in the background. And so, you know, they have a whole history that goes way back, you know, uh, to the house music 
and the DJ culture connected there and the expressions that come out and going all the way back to the soul music. So that's very unique. The dances that came out that then were later, you know, that's where Soul Train started, then moved out west. And then when you come out to the West Coast, you have all these funk bands and all these talent shows that people are doing. And I think it's important that we tap into all these areas and get that oral history. Uh, Absolutely. And, and, you know, we call it hip-hop, but, you know, it has different names um, in different regions. And I think all of this shows up for the same reason. And, and at the end of the day, when you look at it, all those expressions trace themselves back to, you know, African aesthetics. You know, the oral tradition or the way that we move, the, the love for the drum and how it manifests itself, whether we're playing beatboxes or, or, or banging on, on kitchen tables or, or buckets or, or actually playing turntables in the form of break beats. So all that is real important, and, uh, you know, I encourage you, you know, I'll, I'll help out in whatever way I can, but I, I don't think you have to reinvent the wheel. It's really having these conversations with folks that I think have been doing it for a minute. And then, and, and then that, like I said, it, it's, it's part of what we've done as far as me building the, the curriculum is focused on those things, the connection to the African diaspora, the social, political, and economical um, achievements that we made. It's, and, 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 and I think that, again, you you know, those people that you said that and, and those connections and those people that have heard firsthand stories but people that, that are no longer here, that's important because we're trying to also get those primary resources and and have those connections where they would actually speak directly and they can tell their own story. Now, right, and, and, and I'm dictating our own story and telling our own story rather than have outsiders do that. Like you were saying, you have those infiltrators that will come in and what they will do is destroy it and implode it from within, and we, try to, we want to make sure that that doesn't happen. Another question I want to ask you, though, is also, so where do you see the evolution of women in hip-hop from when, we, when, when, it, you know, when it first began to now? And, and, and our continued role in preserving the, the culture? Well, I've been very, very intentional about always um, including women, uh, not only in the conversation, but also in the practice. I mean, if you hear me DJ, you will always hear women artists being played. Uh, I, it's very intentional, not the token way, but also, you know, I understand that there's a different vibration that the female uh, voice brings to the table and, and that it's needed. Uh, but a long time ago, a sister named Tony Blackman, um, who you should know, um, with Freestyle um, Union out of Washington, D.C., uh, and has done a lot of work uh, around hip-hop culture and is a dynamic person that you should really talk to. Uh, I was doing an interview with her in Montreal one day, and she asked a very profound question. She goes, how come nobody ever talks about Cindy Campbell? And, you know, Cindy Campbell is called her sister. And she goes, you know, nobody ever talks about her. Nobody talks about the fact that she organized the party. Nobody talks about the role that she played, that Kirk just didn't bring out the speakers and do it all. He had his sister do it. And, you know, and that, that you know, of course, opened me up. And, and ever since, I made it a point to, you know, to, to uh, be, you know, profoundly uh, inclusive. Um, if you type in, on the website, 500 Female MCs, everybody should know, you'll see a year-long project that I undertook with a number of people, uh, Aisha Fukushima and a few other sisters, where we gathered about uh, 500 women. More, It's actually more than 500. We put links to their songs, and we just used it as a resource. It's there now. And the primary reason for doing that was running into male promoters who would have 30 people on a bill, and you go, where are the women? And they would go, well, you know, ain't nobody trying to check for these women MCs and yada, yada, yada. Or somebody would say, we don't know any. So it was like, you don't know any? Well, here you go. Here's a list. Here's a big list, listed by country. And what we found in doing that is that, one, uh, you take a place like Mexico. They have not one, not two, but four different compilation albums of just women MCs. You know, I mean, it's probably one of the more forward-thinking places. Uh, you find that there are women that are throwing down in Argentina, uh, all throughout the continent, in South Africa, and uh, other, par other parts of the, the continent, all through South America. There's just a lot. And I think what has happened is that, again, going back to the understanding of this being a microcosm, 
that 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 women have always been written out of women have always been written out of history. So I often like to show my class, um, you know, the uh, uh, eyes on the prize where they talk about the uh, Montgomery bus where we talk about the Montgomery bus boycott. And I ask them, well, what do you notice about the Montgomery bus boycott? And they say, oh, there's Martin Luther King, and he led the fight, et cetera, et cetera. And said, well, let's talk about the Women's Political Council, and let's talk about Joanne Robinson, and let's play back her quote, because she had been organizing for a boycott for seven, eight years before King even showed up. She was the one that had 30, 40,000 people on the list. She even says, I'm, you know, that she had to make 30 or 40,000 flyers. So in other words, ain't no boycott unless that sister and her organization put it into motion. And I think a lot of times we find that our sisters have been the glue, have been chief organizers, right. have right. been dynamic leaders who are, are often, oftentimes written out of history. And we have to be very intentional about making sure that there's a seat at the table. Um, I know people like Kevin Powell and others in the past, when they've done uh, panels, they'll be like, it's, it's you, Dave, it's Brother Miles, and it's so, and it's, and it's Big J. But we're going to have to drop one of you to make room for Half Pint. She needs to be at the table. Half Pint and her sister, you know, or her auntie or whoever, to have the gender balance and to make sure that people are, are acclimated and, don't, and, and used to seeing women uh, in leadership uh, and, and, and at the table. So that's real important. And uh, so I think that's going to continue. And if not, hip-hop is going to fall. But in my opinion, I see a lot of women doing the heavy lifting, and, I, and, and they will continue to do the heavy lifting uh, with or without our, our approval, uh, so to speak. You know, they're going to do it because they understand um, it's, it's much deeper than somebody's ego or somebody's narrow perspective. Right, right. That's 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 it. But uh, uh, this is Jacob Bond. I want to say that um, it's it's a balance when you have our sisters. And I know over the years, Public Enemy, we all of these carry um, MC Light, or uh, Queen Latifah on on our tours because we wanted to be a balance of female energy because you know it's necessary. You you you, you know it's, it, 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 it's intelligent. In other words, you've got to have a woman sitting at the table because you get a different perspective from her. You get a, you know, imagine, imagine a, a, a woman as a president and we go in the room. What would she think about? You know what I mean? So uh, I wanted to read something right quick and, and, and get your thoughts on it. It's from um, Black People's Retreat. It says, when... When seeing is believing, those who program what we see also influence what we believe. Our own trust is consistently subject us to seeing only fraudulent worse within ourselves. This warfare tactic is designed to create black self-hatred in the distance that makes us easier to control. What do you think about that? I think that's exactly what Dart Hart Perry was saying in, in, in that interview. You know, right. in order to right. control the people, you control the culture. And that's why I said it's a fault line. You get in that fault line and you can start to uh, you can start to take things out of context and present it in such a way that at the end of the day, um, we start to feel bad about ourselves versus good or we start to have a misconception. And so, um, yeah, I think, you know, that's a spot on thing. Um, the, you know, I, my understanding of history is that there's a realization that you couldn't wipe us out, that you couldn't defeat us. And in fact, if anything, there was always a fear. There was a fear that sooner or later we were going to come back and take everybody out. I mean, that's how the slave owners, you know, used to, to live. They were always afraid that the, the African was going to rebel. So once you realize that you can't get rid of the African, the best thing to do is try to control the African's mind and, and you know, and get them to buy into your program. And part of that program was, to, uh, to, to paint a picture of dehumanization. Have us think that we're, we're dumb. Have us uh, think that we're, we don't have technological prowess and reframe uh, how history is so that when we see ourselves, we see ourselves as savages when really history shows that we came to the table. We came to the United States with a skill set already there. We knew architecture, which they were able to use. We knew farming. 
which they were able to use. Nobody had to sit up there and teach us and educate us. It was the other way around. Uh, right. I'll close by saying this. You know, one of the things that I always teach the class, I say, let's compare hip-hop with Steve Jobs and, uh, and Steve Wozniak, the founders of Apple. When they founded Apple, one of the first things that they did was they created a blue box, um, which allowed you to make free phone calls um, so you didn't have to pay, you know, at, at that time in the 80s, you had to pay 10 cents, 20 cents a minute if you made a long-distance phone call. That would be considered wire fraud. But at the time, that was seen as them being adventurous and forward-thinking and innovative. Now, you take the black kid who is uh, hijacking a street lamp and getting free electricity to throw a party in the park or taking apart a turntable and flipping it or building speakers. I know I built my own speakers, those types of things. That's looked at as either uh, uh, criminal behavior or something that is not to be nurtured, but like, well, why'd you build your own speakers when you could have just bought one? Versus going, oh, if you all built your speakers, let us help you take it to the next level. How can we nurture that? So I think, you know, how we reframe it. So we see ourselves as not intelligent folks. We see ourselves as criminals who are getting into mischief, and everybody else is seen as innovative and forward-thinking, and, and their mischievousness is the groundwork for... Uh, 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 Institutions that we all, you know, use, the iPhone and YouTube and all those other things. And, and, I, and I think we forget that we invent these things as well. <laughs> That's exactly right. right. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. I, I, we, Brother James, in, in half pint, if y'all don't mind, Brother Miles, I, I want to, we have about maybe 20 minutes left, and I want to, before we, we go into the need for a cultural revolution, if it, you know, what that means to Davey and his view and perspective on that. I want to ask that my brother, Chairman Fred Hampton Jr., jump into the conversation. Uh, he's a part of the roundtable discussion. He's on the line, and, and I want to get his thoughts on what he's heard up to this point and let him chime in um, because our brother, the Chairman, has a, has a view and, and a perspective, and he's also a very well-loved man within the hip-hop community. So I, I wanna I wanna ask the chairman family. I, I'm sorry if y'all heard a, a mute real quick, but I wanna I wanna ask the chairman to, to just chime in on what he's heard up to this point and to give us some of his uh, his thoughts on the dialogue up to this point, and then we'll go right into the need for a cultural revolution. So, Chairman Fred Hampton Jr., welcome back to the conversation, my brother. And it's always good to be back with you, my brother Greetings. You, my brother Miles, Grand Point, brother David, good good. Uh, and you heard everybody else on the line with you. I caught bits and pieces uh, of it. I just want to uh, respect you add in, too. Um, and uh, really waiting for the points that y'all, that y'all have already laid out, how important is the uh, document um, entry, hip hop, and every other genre. And uh, ironically, I was just watching this one of these pieces, but uh, this Who Shot Big and Tupac piece. And I, one of my criticisms was, was, was about the. Um, and not to sound uh, like a quote-unquote conspiracy theory, but always stressing it. And I know something, we, we know this, but uh, we said that I know for conclusion, but the whole political dynamics of it, you know, and like even in addition to the gender contradiction, we talk about, some, I think David Dean talked about, even uh, in Alabama, um, aside from like the country, but, uh, even with the women, it's, it's, it was strategic that um, people like Claudette Coleman were not mentioned as opposed to rules of policy, so even the, the negating of uh, uh, the document of Kennedy Jackson, that you know, people know about that. And, all, and, and you draw the coalition, this is the consistent um, strand um, within our, our hip hop, the go go music, our movement. How even the soul train, the soul train was even mentioned earlier. I can't remember the other guy's name the, uh, who uh, initially was a co founder of uh, with soul train of uh, 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 the Don Cornelius, who was Chicago police. Uh, uh, in Chicago, but I've got the other guy's name. But some of the tactics that have been, uh, have been this is no slight on Don Cornelius, but something a constant strand is in our music, whatever genre in our movement, is even how, in many cases, the more palatable, regardless of gender, gender, the more palatable individuals are raised up. And so I think it's something that we, uh, we, we, we point this out and also uh, document uh, so we can acknowledge 
uh, like even, uh, everything from the co-opting to what type of faces I put up, and even down to the fascination. Because I even discussed with this, the new child speaking in part, you can see uh, the negation of the count insurgency. Not, not, not so we just talking about music. We just talking about hip hop. We just talking about global music. But again, that we, as I, as our people in particular, cannot afford the luxury to have any conversation negating that we are, that we are being targeted, even if we're not talking about resistance. You know what I'm saying? The count insurgency. I mean, up from the drum, I mean, the fact that the drum was even outlawed, you know, in, in, in North America. That's part, that's, that's the inclusive in the conversation. That was part of the council circuit. So, yes, I just, just want to, I, I know sometimes this is a good thing, but I just want to go on record, reiterate, stretch the whole political significance of not, you know, this is something that, it's, 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 it's something that's strategically targeted again in every genre, our music, our, I mean, our, our, our poetry. Our, our relationships, our movements, and every dynamic of our life. Beautiful. I, I appreciate that, uh, Chairman. And thank you for chiming in with that. You may have missed earlier where Davey was talking about an interview that Bill Noble, late Bill Noble, had with an FBI, a former FBI informant, black man who was under the name Othello. Mm. And, and Dave, okay. and, 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 I, you know, Dave, if you want to reiterate some of that, that, that's fine. I saw that interview some years ago, and, well, you know, when, well, when, the, just, when the guy was... I'm well, sorry, let me just, yeah, just like Jeremy Fred was saying, I play that in every single class that I do. And right on. I mean, I play the interview because part of, part of what, what Brother is talking about is the reworking of the mind. So I've got folks mm -hmm. that are sitting there that have been conditioned. Some of it is no child left behind. So, uh, a good part of it is what has been targeted. Uh, a lot of this is institutionalized. So that history becomes boring. And it becomes most boring for all people. So I will have a class of 200 people and the folks who are least, you know, uh, I wouldn't say, I don't want to stereotype, but a good, a good amount of time, a lot of the people who would find it most boring would be our own. They'd be like, no, I don't want to hear that was back in the day. And so I'd be like, okay, well, look, mm -hmm. some of y'all are going to find this boring, and I understand why you find it boring, because you've been conditioned to not respect, you know, black history. You've been conditioned not to respect your own history. You know, mm -hmm. uh, you had radio stations all around the country, you know, where mm -hmm. they would fine people um, for playing something more than five years old. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I told the story when I was in the class about how, you know, our old program director had James Brown show up at the station. True story, in 2000, you know, a couple of weeks after Columbine, he had a blue suit on, showed up, and they wouldn't let him on the air. Talking about James Brown had no relevance to our audience. Now, I see James, so I sat him, I, I took him into the studio, and we did an interview, and we figured, you know, we'll play the interview and on, on my show. And for the first time ever, mm -hmm. they pulled that interview and said there's no relevance to our audience. So that meant a generation of people Wow. don't know who James Brown is. That's very yeah. deliberate. Now, the same company, because this was a clear channel station, right next door, you know, the Beatles show up with a box set. they doing a Beatles special. they got vignettes. They're bringing all the bells and whistles. And you know all about the Beatles, except that they were first signed to a black-owned label. You know, that's the part they'll leave out. They won't tell you about BG mm -hmm. Records out of Chicago mm -hmm. and how they were signed to that. You know, but everything yeah. else, they'll tell you the whole nine yards. Um... You know, uh, you know, U2 comes out, um, they'll give the whole history. Um, the blues artist, you know, heck, Mick Jagger will get on stage, and he'll say, look, Howlin' Wolf and all these guys is where we got our music from, but you don't give the blues or any of that stuff on our own urban station. And that's very, very deliberate, but it goes back to what the chairman is saying. You want to have folks who ultimately um, are, are devoid of history. Part of it is to keep them from being a threat to keep them from building off of the wealth right. of violence from the past. But the more immediate thing is just to make them a consumer. You know, it's like, you just, you know, you're just an empty vessel. You have no commitment or no attachment to anything, you know, in today and out tomorrow. They say microwave. And so that's the challenge that we have. So, and, and, I, and I show the classes, you know, uh, the class. I pull out my iPhone 5, which I'm on right now, and I say, here's iPhone 5, there's the Internet. It, it allows me to take pictures. It, it, you know, I can text everybody. I can do whatever I want. Why do I need to pay $1,500 for an iPhone 10? 
And then I tell them how they'll pay people to stand online. They'll, they'll have deals with all the TV stations. So every newscaster is standing in front of an iPhone store, making it seem like it's a news story, when it's really just a glorified commercial. And the point is, is what Fred was saying, is that you're, 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 you're reframing things and you're socializing people to not have self-worth. You're socializing people to, um, to move in another direction. And yeah, it's part of a counterinsurgency program. Black people are targeted, but I would say at this point in time, the whole damn country who ain't part of the one success is targeted. That's the real irony. Okay. <laughs> you know, so I think okay. we're all subjected to it right now. Okay. Okay. Absolutely. I appreciate that, David. I think I think as we got we wind down, Brother Miles, y'all. As we as we wind down, I think it's it's a good segue into the need for a cultural revolution. And what does that mean to you, David? Cultural revolution. Is there a need for a cultural revolution? What does that mean to you? Yes, I think there is a cultural revolution. Um you can hear me, clear. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, sir. Perfectly fine. Okay. I, you know, I come back to the reframing. I think there is a cultural revolution. You got people on the phone having a conversation. That's a cultural revolution. That's the start of it. You have people that are doing good work, whether it's Half Pint, whether it's Chairman Fred and the PLCC and other folks. I think that's a part. I think that's all part of a cultural revolution. It means it's resistance, and we recognize the impact of culture. Um, Maybe we have different expectations of what that may look like and what the end result will be and how quickly that end result occurs. Um, I think if we go down the road uh, 20, 30 years down here, we'll be talking about, I remember when, you know, when you guys were doing conference calls talking about cultural revolution. And, and look at the impact it had. Let's dial that same thought back and let's go back to... Let's, go, let's dial this back and go back to 1986-87. In 1986 and 1987, uh, there was a bunch of people that used to go to a nightclub called the Latin Court. And, you know, my friend Paradise Gray, that's somebody who used to get on the, on, on the line. Oh, yeah, we've um, had it, yeah. Yeah, so Dice, you know, Dice wrote a whole book about it, how they were having meetings, and they were saying, look, right. black folks are getting their gold chain snatched. And it's becoming the subject of violence. It's becoming a target for violence at the Latin Quarter. At the same time, that gold is coming from apartheid South Africa. How can we change the value? And what, one of the things that he did, or one of the things that they did was they had a series of meetings. And in those meetings, they said, we're going to change the value system. It's no longer going to be the gold chain that we value, but it's going to be the leather African medallion that people have on. And so right. before anybody could get on the stage, since Paradise controlled the stage, it was like, you can't perform unless you have this medallion on. Now, at the time, people probably thought, oh, you know, what does that mean? But years later, we look back and say, oh, the golden era of hip-hop. What a great time when all this Afrocentricity was coming out. But it was because of those meetings that they had at the Latin right. Party a small meeting with a bunch of people whose names we didn't know who said we're going to be very intentional about changing the value system. So I think a cultural revolution is happening. I think we just got to scale up and we just got to continue to do the work and understand that the more work we put in, the more they're going to try to uh, camouflage it and, or peacock it and make it seem like we ain't doing anything. So this phone call we're on, is like, oh, it's just a phone call. They're still, you know, slaughtering us. No, this phone call is a threat. This phone call is movement. This phone call is part of that revolution. And so, by all means necessary, they're going to try and dismiss it and try and make it seem like it's just insignificant. It's just Brother Miles and a few people on a phone call. No, it's Brother Miles planting seeds with a bunch of people and everybody getting inspired, everybody feeling what's going on, so that the next day and the day after, we really take it to the next level in our respective efforts. That's the cultural revolution. That's, that's very powerful, David, and I, and I appreciate those words, and, and I think that that's fuel and energy and, and, and fire beneath our feet to keep pushing and going even further. You know, sometimes, even even as an active member of the Nation of Islam and, and active in, in various aspects of, of community work, um, and even active with, with this, 
you know, there are, there are times where we're so engaged, you know, and dust is being kicked up that we really don't necessarily see the impact, but the enemy is always watching. I wanted, I wanted, I was hoping you, you would have reiterated a little bit about that Gil Noble interview, um, only because, and, and I can say it, but only because I thought it was powerful when, when he talked about studying and infiltrating where culture is concerned. You know, I remember the, the well, let me just real quick, I, re I remember that agent talking about the burning down. Uh, uh, of of that building, and he was like, man, you know, I built the stage. You know what I mean? He got he was he although infiltrated, although he infiltrated, he was also actively engaged because you can't infiltrate. You know, it, it's like Jesus, you know, Mary and Jesus, you know, hiding in Egypt. So that they could escape the authorities, but this is a, a, a white woman and a white baby hiding in black Egypt. You stand out like a sore thumb. So you can't just come in as an agent or from written across your shirt or on your hat. You got to do the work of the revolutionary to try to, you know, blend in with the revolutionary, but all the while working to destabilize the movement, tear it down, destroy it, discourage the, the active participants, et cetera. And, I, and I'm saying that because what you just said, you know, sometimes we don't engage in the work. It's not enough, you know, to be a Sunday go to church Christian, a Sunday go to mosque Muslim, you know, a Sunday get on the call part of, of, of this hip hop for justice movement and the cultural revolution. I think what you're doing, and, and there's many on this line that are just muted, but they're listening, but they're active. My hope and prayer is that we all get more active or ramp it up, as you said. You know, I, I think the time requires that we engage more critically and more deliberately and, and ramp up our effort because effort, we're really in a race against time. We didn't get into a deep spiritual conversation, but if we take what we're hearing from Daisy, from Half Pint, from James Bond, from Chairman Fred Campton Jr., if we take what we're hearing from these great men and women and the knowledge that they're giving us and take it up from, from the basic level of talking about hip-hop, music, cultural expression, et cetera, but take it up higher and ask yourself, why would the enemy infiltrate the Watch Poet Society? Why would the enemy... Info. So why would J. Edgar Hoover say we have to prevent the rise of a black messiah? Why would he use biblical language when he's targeting black revolutionary movements and organizations working for the freedom, justice, and equality of black people in America? Why use messiah? we got to take our minds and our thinking up to a much higher level. And I think Davey is helping us to see better the overall effort. It's a hell of a thing to keep this thing active for three years. And Davey's been here since day one. He's not on every call. His schedule won't allow him to be on every call. But Davey is, is well aware of the movement and what we've been doing that he's been a part of. It, it was a no-brainer to call Davey and to reach out for him because I know what he does. But I'm just saying that, family, let's take what he's saying and what he gave and, and everybody else that chimed in on this round table, and let's get more active because we are literally in a race against time. Davey, I cut you off. I know you wanted to say something. We definitely want to hear any final words that you want to share before we go. Feel free. Yeah, my, the little ones are in the car with me so they can rest with somebody. Get ready to go. But let me say this. I think a good blueprint, um, I think, comes from what you all did with Paris, uh, when, when Paris, uh, the artist, when he first came out. And, yes, sir. You know, uh, one of the things that I liked was that Paris was given a lot of information. Uh, That's right. And right. with that information, when you opened up his album cover, you were able to see that information. He was like, oh, here's the 10 point platform um, from the Panthers. Oh, this is what the Nation of Islam is about. If you go back to his album sleeve, you know, you, you can get all that information. And I think. I, I think, you know, I think Chairman Tred and them try to do that with some of the artists as well. Have these conversations and understand, like, you know what? I don't expect Migos to 
you know, give me my politics. I don't want them to give me my politics. But you know what? If Migos shouts out a political prisoner or if they put a James Brown riff like they have in their new song and they just say a couple of something, it opens up the door for a larger conversation for us to organize around. And I think, you know, having these conversations, giving people those tidbits, giving them information, providing a resource. So if they want to look up something and go, man, I don't even know about it, they can just punch in and go hit some bullet points for me to maybe include in a song. You know, they might have 15 songs that talk about, you know, making money at the nightclub, but that one song that they have might be an anthem song to talk about liberation. And I think we have to have those type of conversations with all of them, the, the conscious artists as well as the ones that we would say are mumble rappers. Because they hit, you know, our community. And, and I can just tell you, you know, like my class, you know, you walk in there and start telling them that Migos or Cardi B stinks, they'll walk out on you. That Those are their heroes and heroes. I don't know how it got to be that way, but I ain't going to downgrade them. I'm going to sit there and, 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 you know, build with them around that so that by the time everything is said and done, they get bits and pieces. And, and you see movement like that. Cardi B will get on her, her Instagram and talk about Lydia. She'll, she'll say a few things. Right. And you run with it. Maybe somebody gave her a little tidbit information. Maybe she just did it just to win points. Well, if it's points that she's trying to win, you got your points. But I'm going to use that to open up a conversation and say, see, even Cardi B is talking about Libya. Even Cardi right. B is critical of that. Now let's see some other folks that are also critical of that and take it to the next level. Those are the types of things that I think we do. Um, we can put on shows like Paradise did and say the only way you can get on the show is that you got to do a song about liberation or freestyle and here's a thousand dollars if you can do it. People will find a way to get informed, you know, when we do those types of things and uh, we just got to be intentional. Man, I, I agree with you 100%. And I know, Davey, I know you got to run and we appreciate, you know, the time that you, you've taken to be on. I do want to ask if, if Pat Pike, Chairman Fred, and, and Brother right James have any have any final any final words that they wanna they wanna share. But I think, you know, what what David just said is very critical because it's really a, a method. You know, it's a methodology that I know the chairman uses. I know we in the nation use it. You know, many people have seen pictures of the minister, Minister Farrakhan sitting with Jeezy, sitting with Migos, sitting, sitting with Rick Ross, sitting with Dane Dad, sitting with Kanye and his family, sitting with Sai High the Prince sitting on the Breakfast Club, sitting with Sway, sitting with Big Boy, you know, and, and so many other artists, Vic Mensa, Kendrick Lamar, Eminem, so many, and this is not new, but, but this generation is seeing this for the first time. The minister goes back with, with hip-hop all the way back and and with with those that are in art and, and culture, Nina Simone and, and many, many others. He has very great relationships with, with many of our brothers and sisters who are artists. The minister himself was a musician prior to coming into the nation of Islam. But my point here is just to add to what Davey said is I actually, I actually put a post up because my big brother's speech from Arrested Development had did a post and Raven Simone reposted and I guess you call it the infamous picture now where you see, you know, Jay-Z, Diddy, T.I., uh, Steve Stout, and I don't, I can't name everybody, but it was a lot of people. I think it was the pre-Grammy party that, that Rock Nation had or something just a couple weeks ago. But Speech had, had said something because he gave a different view and perspective, and it, it created a, a huge dialogue, and, and a lot of people started talking. And I think when Raven Simone retweeted it or reposted it, you know, people kind of came at, at her, but it originated from Speech. And he can go on speeches Instagram and Facebook, and he addresses it, and, and he puts the link up in his profile, you know, on his profile page or whatever, so that you can see the, his larger, you know, explanation of the of the why, you know, and 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 I respect him for that. I added something to it, and whoever saw it saw it, but I basically was saying what what Davey had just said when you're, when you're talking about elevating the consciousness of a people when you're talking about resurrection you're not talking about going out to cemeteries and saying live 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 or going out there with holy water and throwing it on dirt 
or going out there and busting as many rock hard prayers as you can to raise people up out of the dirt. That's not going to happen. You'll end up in the dirt with them while you're doing that. What, what, what we're talking about is raising the consciousness, elevating the consciousness, giving knowledge and raising people up degree by degree. And I likened it as it is written in the Holy Quran in the alternation of the day and the night. There's a sign for those who keep their duty. And, and, and if you look at it, if anybody, any one of us have ever been in a, in a matinee movie during the daytime, late morning, and come out in the, in the early afternoon, your eyes get adjusted to the darkness of the theater. And when you come out into the brightness of the day, sometimes it has a, a harsh impact on you. You could leave out of your house and it can just be the angle of the sun hitting, hitting your, your, where your front door is. And that brightness of the light can have an effect on you to cause you to, to start to squint or put your hand over your eyebrows to block the sunlight. That's, there's a sign there for us, family. God never brings us from darkness into light instantly because it would damage your eye. He never takes you from light into darkness instantly. We didn't come from Africa and become instant Negroes. We didn't come from Africa, kings and queens, and become gangbangers overnight. There was a process to break us, and there's a process to raise us. So we can never take the judgmental position on Migos, Cardi B, or New Age Jerk Boy, even though we see some really dumb stuff happening, those of us that have been blessed with greater knowledge and, and some degrees of consciousness have to be the guys and the counselors and have to help to raise the people degree by degree. So I agree with what my brother Dave said, and I agree with my, my brother's speech and the angle that he gave. We gotta we gotta look at everything and get a full 360 degree perspective on it all in order for us to be effective. So with that being said, family, I want to thank you all for being on the line. I do want to ask, that, that's it for me. I do want to ask my sister Half Frank any any final words that she may have, and then we'll go to my brother Chairman Fred Hampton Jr. for any final words that he may have, and then we'll end it with my brother James Bond, from Public Enemy, and any final words that he may have. My sister, half pint. Anything you want to close out with? No, brother. I think everything was said. I think uh, it's another productive phone call and conference call. I think that, like like they, you said, we just have to now start implementing. Um, there's nothing else to say. That part. <laughs> nah, that part. We got to ramp it up. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Absolutely. My brother, Jeremy. My brother, it's always an honor to be again with you. We appreciate you being in your belt. And again, I'm going to work on that board. Uh-oh. Wait. Uh-oh. 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 Uh
because they can say, okay, this camera free as well. You got it. I'm held accountable. So even our forces will respect us if we are to be, again, reward those who do the right things and we become some those don't. And understand in this war, this war that is waged on us, which comes through bullets and sugar coated bullets, which comes through bombs and propaganda bombs, we must understand that there are there are and there will be some casualties of war. You know, you know what I'm saying? And, and, and we have to look at this in context of this war being waged on us, and there will be allies as well as there be adversaries. And we have to come up with that clarity. Absolutely. I agree 100%. Thank you, brother, for, for, for your final Thank word. you. Thank, Thank you all. My brother, the game. Um, yes, sir. Uh, I, I would just say um, our unity, our unity is, 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 is a deep. If we unite, it will change our reality overnight. And that's all I would say. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Brother James, half fine, Chairman Fred. Davey, I think you're still with us. And if you are, we certainly want to close out with any final words that you may want to give if you're still with us. Yeah, I'm just saying, you know, thank you for having me on the call. Um, I hope what I said made sense. And, you know, for me, um, you know, we, we shouldn't neglect the spiritual aspect of our existence and our existence. Um, That's right. I, I, I'm a firm believer in. In, in something much more powerful than myself and our collective self that allows us to, uh, you know, to still be standing in spite of all this. And my favorite thing is, is saying this, you know, uh, Goliath seems in, invincible. When you go back to that story of uh, David and Goliath, um, he was a huge monster. Uh, he was known to just crush everybody. Uh, but Dave had five smooth stones in his pocket and only needed one take them out. And right. say that, you know, all giants will fall. Goliath will always lose his Goliath always overreaches. You know, Goliath will always uh, uh, take more than what he can really handle. It is up to us to have those five smooth stones and be practicing our aim. Uh, so I come back to, you know, I think all the work that we're doing, we're, 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 we're getting our aim together. And, and I, would, I would say that Goliath has already been hit. And right now he's flailing. You know, right. his arms are flailing. He's right. on the ground trying to get his balance. He, he, he's knocking everything out the way. The question is, just, who's got that second stone to take him out? Don't let him get his balance back. Hit him again with that other stone and we'll win. So I believe we will win. And I say that with, you know, conviction. And that's, that's the spiritual aspect of where I come from. We are absolutely 155% going to win this day. Um, and I, I really believe that. So, And I think that's their fear, is that they know we believe it. <laughs> and that makes, them, that makes us want to turn it up even more. So I'll leave it at that. And thank you. Man, thank you, Davey. I, th- I love the way. I'm glad you stayed on and until the end and, and, and hit us with the David and Goliath. We mentioned that quite often, you know, on this platform. Um, and, and I think that's a perfect way to end it. And I... And, you know, I know your name is is, is Davy, <laughs> David, and, and that's a David and Goliath story. <laughs> and, I, and I don't think it's an accident that David was a musician. David played a, a string instrument, and I don't think it's accidental that that he had roots in in art and culture. On top of being king, I don't think it's an accident that that there's the art and cultural expression that David has, and I don't think it's an accident that the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan is, is a violinist and came into the nation of Islam as a musician. And I'll say this, family, God willing, in the next two weeks, uh, we will host our annual Savior's Day convention, and it was announced today. I don't know how many on this call have ever heard this or know this. I'm sure some do. But the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, who, in my humble opinion, is the leader of the revolution, and that's who I follow. Um, we don't, you know, push religious viewpoints on this platform, but everybody knows who's been on this call, you know, who, who Brother James and I represent, and they've heard from Minister Farrakhan's representatives here in this city, and they've heard from, from others, but... I'll say this, the minister has recorded a major 
project a not just an album, but I believe it's a multi volume project. Um, and some of those that are featured on this project are Damian Marley, uh, Stevie Wonder, Rick Ross, Snoop, and others. Um, I think Buster Rhymes is on there. I think Nas is on there, but I'm, I'm not sure. But in the next few days, there's going to be an announcement made uh, because this project will be released soon. And we want to make sure that, that everybody has an opportunity to get it and to experience it. Because sometimes, you know, you never really get to know the true heart of a man. The minister said, he said, I think sometimes that's best expressed through music. So many of us have a view. Um, and it's, I know Davey. I've sat with Davey D many, 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 many times. I've seen him. We've marched together. We've been at rallies together. We've done interviews with Davey. Uh, he's interviewed Minister Farrakhan's representative here. Davey has represented us at the very first hip-hop summit at Minister Farrakhan's home after Tupac and Biggie were, were assassinated. Um, Jane Baum knows Davey. Jeremy Fred knows Davey. So, you know, we know him, but some other leaders know him through articles and websites or, or seeing him on Evolution of Hip Hop or seeing him on Beef or some documentary. Um, and I think some people know the minister from a very limited perspective. And I say this, family, in closing, you know, I think that the response that Brother James and I have been blessed to get, which has been overwhelming, in the way of support and participation on this platform. It doesn't come from the respect that people have for me because many people i met on this platform. i met through people that have been on this platform and they connected me with a Charles Sharp or Andrew Williams Jr. or, a, you know, Patchy or Michelle Farrell or, you know, people that I didn't know before we met on this platform, but the honor and the respect that people get really isn't due to the, the work of Brother James and I. It's, it's really the work of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan and the years of service and people knowing. Daddy O told me this the other day. I was talking with Daddy O, legendary Daddy O from Central Sonic, and he really just said it's because people know that we're connected to the minister and they know that service record. They know that history, so they know they can open up on a platform like this. And these are Daddy O's words. He said, we go on interviews, and we know what we're going to give people. We're going to give them this, we're going to say this, and we're going to do this, and that's it. Because we don't know the angle they're going to edit it with. We don't know how they're going to present it. We don't know nothing. But on this hip-hop and justice platform, he said, we bleed. In other words, we give it all because we're open and able to express ourselves Freely. I take that in, in high regard and honor, and I know that that's not from me, and I know that's not from my brother James. It's from the work of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. So I, I want to close with that because I was moved to say that. I always want to be showing respect and love and gratitude for the work and the service of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. In the next two weeks, God willing, we will be celebrating his over 60 years of service in Chicago. And God willing, Chairman, I'll be able to see you there, brother, um, and we'll be able to connect and know there'll be a record on a representative body from Hip Hop for Justice that'll be in Chicago with us. So with that said, family, I thank you all for being on this line, for spending some of your Sunday evening with us. Thank my big brother, Davey D., for giving so much. Really, he gave us the marching orders, too. And I think we need to be good soldiers and hear and obey the correctness of those instructions and the guidance that he gave. There's people that we need to connect with, and maybe you can connect me with people. Um, but let's make it happen, family. Let's ramp it up, because we got a lot more work to do, but we're in a race against time. So God willing, family, we'll be on next week. Next week, we will be, we will have a very, very special uh, dialogue and discussion 
next Sunday. And in a few days, you all will get alerted as to who we have. But trust me, you're not going to want to miss next week. So stay, you know, keep your ears open, your, your, your eyes open, and you'll be alerted as to who our special guest will be uh, next week. So, family, thank you all once again. God willing, we'll, we'll meet again next Sunday. Peace and love, family. Peace. 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 Goodbye. Amen. Amen. All right, I'm going back to Spreaker right now for just a second so I can play a song for you. Absolutely. Since they mentioned his sister who hurt, I'm going to play that song again. Honest to God. Honest to God. Honest to God. Honest to God, be the one who choose. Honest to God, when I step into the boots. Honest to God, I'm the one, I'm the man. Honest to God, I'm the dude for the fan. Honest to God, honest to God. Still feeling like pressure. No people for me to even begin to measure. Way up and down low, I'm inbound. Trade tables to upright, it's touchdown. Move on this policy, ain't bringing it modestly. Obviously, I was telling the story through real artistry. Ignoring every piece of my heart. Look what you started, see, had to switch it up. Was the only way, logically. Don't consider me a casualty after the fact. Cats need to know what the stats be. Clutching on they gas, better know who your past be. Hunting them in they sleep, ain't no running from this travesty. Head swelling since 9-4. Ain't no telling rap just behind closed doors. Professor Lesson, I'm guessing the test be so gore. I'm bringing eye of the tiger. Listen to me. Honest to God, be the one who choose. Honest to God, when I step into the boots. Honest to God, I'm the one, I'm the man. Honest to God, I'm a dude for the fan. Honest to God, be the one who choose. Honest to God, when I step into the boots. Honest to God, I'm the one, I'm the man. See, they got me blanking with it. Bruce Lee and your tie bow, you can't win. Articulating your quick fate, controlling your mind. Stay spit bars like three times my weight. Last dragon, feeling the glow. You gorgeous ladies, wrestling, transcending your flow. So why you still acting? Somebody hand me my powder, you need a pimp smack. You made a meal of these cats, I'm just snacking. Do you know who you woke up? Gonna be trouble, the presentation be conduct. The reservation of one mind beyond up. If any rhyme, your whole squad been chopped up. Screw face, can't even speak me. Banana hammock wearing the sleep. One the full bag is all you keep. That deliverance, leaving them weak, quivering. So cold, leave a Siberian hut stuck. Honest to God, I'll be the one who the truth. Honest to God, when I step into the boots. Honest to God, I'm the one who the man. Honest to God, I'm yeah. do it for the fan. Honest to God, I'll be the one who the truth. Honest to God, when I step into the boots. Honest to God, I'm the one who the man. Honest to God, I'm the do it for the fan. Honest to God, honest to God. Honest to God. Gonna reach into the constellations, grabbing your fate like the beat keep breaking, leaving them belly hurting, feeling anticipation. They know that when it drops. It burns Satan. Simple harass. Question your status. Yes, I'm the maddest. Fear of my black hat. Sis, get back. First track. Go to war. Brawl fat. Exposing your simple spat. Flows with all my old tracks. Hunting you down just like a dentist. Murdering people just fun. No real nourish. Your simulated comfort about to be deplenished. Releasing lyrical crack and whipping your fixings. Turned up on a Tuesday. When your chick in the club, she ain't Tuesday. Do buying the drinks. Oh, now she loose. Hey, hit them with that EBT. Now you're moving. Honest to God, I'll be the one who the truth. Honest to God, when I step into the boots. Honest to God, I'm the one who the man. Honest to God, I'm a dude for the fan. Honest to God, I'll be the one who the truth. Honest to God, when I step into the boots. Honest to God, I'm the one who the man. Honest to God, I'm a dude for the fan. Honest to God, 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 honest to God.
Wake up, can't stretch and yawn in a tight situation. Face blurry and stainless steel mirrors, but clearly facing incarceration. Consequence of a blind step took. Affiliation with hooks who perpetrate a crook. Next time I look for ways before crossing my destiny. Too gifted to be bound for life in this penitentiary. Got a soul worth touching and touching others is in me. Shall I leave haters choking to death as they breathe in envy? All coming from their own demise. Suffer internally from an emotion of despise. May spiritual cowards painfully seep through hell's flaming crevice. Hoping before I go, clean up parts of my life. Stank with a blemish, out to reap the everlasting when I sow. That's why the world got a pass on my wrath. I learned to let go. Out to reap the everlasting when I sow. That's why the world got a pass on my wrath. I learned to let go. Fighting being tucked away. Spend most of my life dodging that fatal day. Ask for more time when I pray. Ended up living way reckless. Hoping I don't run out of time before finding correctness. Will I be saved before I go? I act now with no way till tomorrow. Tomorrow's ain't promising death is for certain. Times of the essence, chase your blessing before we close the curtain. Assigned to speak in light of the glorious father as he sits in dislike. Heartache and bothered about death, bed robbers, unclutch the pistols and commit to his word. Trust and believe it's the most prosperous sword, proven to conquer all. Replenish the earth and let the beast fear and fall. Don't let religion cloud your relationship with spiritual growth. Straddle no fences, understanding you can't stand in both. Renewing of your mind reveals the real G is for God. So G up and rep your hood heaven in similar regards. External pains can hinder, subtract your mind out the blender. It won't mix in the spiritual walk of a healing offender. Deny your flesh, there's no one true, meaning a bless. Time running out to open your mouth to confess. Can't do it all alone, God knows best. Came from seeing and evil doings, so I can attest. Fighting being tucked away. Spend most of my life dodging that fatal day. Ask for more time when I pray. Ended up living way reckless. Hoping I don't run out of time before finding correctness. Will I be saved before I go? I act now with no way till tomorrow. Tomorrow's ain't promising death is for certain. Times of the essence, chase your blessing before we close the curtain. The Father alone authorizes dates and times. We know what we know. Just let the Holy Spirit free your mind. Learn to be a visionary like Paul the Apostle. They say, God had picked me to tell you. Part of my soul search and mission is to see and share this heavenly vision to be transformed into a new creation. Let's gently and humbly help one another. It's hard to prosper through anything when letting your rage thunder ever wonder what life will be like. Mine is the self-made man is not allowing flesh to take life. Better to sit pressure and persecution or walk about faith God sent than to sit in destitution of the new covenant. Comfort and assurance and salvation need to get there. How much longer must we live untamed in a sin-filled atmosphere? Swag really smothered and filled while procrastinations are flawed. We all share. Fighting being tucked away. Spend most of my life dodging that fatal day. Ask for more time when I pray. Ended up living way reckless. Hoping I don't run out of time before finding correctness. Will I be saved before I go? I act now with no way till tomorrow. Tomorrow's ain't promising death is for certain. Times of the essence, chase your blessing before we close the curtain. Indeed, I want to turn it up because I'm amped up. If I had a rap that was turned up, I'll be rapping it right now. Check it out. Do you know that the Hip Hop for Justice Call is every Sunday, 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Thank you for everybody that tuned in, that will tune in next Sunday and will share this evening. And just follow Hip Hop for Justice on Instagram and stay in tune for the new flyers. Stay abreast of the number that you can call in and listen to listen for yourself. Because, I mean, I know it's fun to just sit up there and watch me and never know what I'm going to do. But today I was doing a lot of typing because I, I didn't use the monitor, but I did the typing in the thread. So that way people would have uh, a little catalog of information because sometimes it's easier when you're at work and listen to the radio or Facebook and you're allowed to at work and so forth, you can read through the thread and know what's going on and you can support in that facet too because there's a lot of different layers to supporting a cultural revolution as discussed by Miles Muhammad and the whole Roundtable family. Shout out to everybody there in Oakland, 
that would be half pine and you know what some people from different places as well so i'm not really sure where davy b lives i definitely want to shout out the guest speaker tonight my brother right there i love him james bomb definitely chairman fred hampton jr and a plethora of other people that are online thank you for chiming in i see you in the comments on facebook it should be available for posting right now because you know how sometimes it goes through the situation so they can see if there was any music that wasn't supposed to be on there on there and that type of thing so matter of fact i'm going to conclude this radio show and go back and edit that facebook live video and then ensure that i don't have any copyrights or any music that may have been heard during the broadcast for hip-hop for is and I thank you once again for your input, your support. God bless you. Have a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful week. Ooh.